This is a podcast that seeks justice. Justice for the lives stolen by those in society that hide amongst us every day. Hidden in our towns, cities and countrysides, the places that we work, and sometimes in our very own homes. This is Hidden Killers. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Tony Bruschi. Be sure to press subscribe wherever you download podcasts so you don't miss any breaking updates or discussions on the cases that we are following here for you. Today, we are joined by former Secret Service investigative consultant Jim Rathman. Always a pleasure to have Jim on the show. We're going to be talking about the case against Brian Koberger. We're going to start out by talking about some of the Bluetooth footprints that have likely been left by Mr. Koberger. We've been hearing rumblings about this over the last, well, over many months. This has been going on for now, about two months. And to me, honestly, it's been a little bit confusing. I I know how Bluetooth works. I I use it all the time. Uh, But something that I'm not quite understanding here is the signature that it can leave behind either on the device that it may be detecting is in range of connecting to or the signature that it may be leaving on the device when you take a look at it and says okay these are your devices i i i don't know how that's tracked i don't know how that's stored but apparently there's some sort of signature there jim can you give us some insight on that yeah i mean this is some newer technology and things they're able to do i believe that was said by the uh the former fbi agent um regard to this but almost like you know how on your cell phone when you're driving around you can pick up different wi-fi signals yeah well, it kind of leaves a little bit of a footprint in each one of those that you go, each server that it, it can attempt to connect to. Okay. And Bluetooth, from my understanding, can do just about the same thing. So it has the ability to connect to whether it's a speaker system, a television, um, anything that it can actually connect itself with. It kind of leaves that footprint. Mm-hmm. So what they're saying in this particular case is that when he was there, the Bluetooth was able to connect to something within the house and be able to put him on that scene because it's very specific to him. Oh, so that, that's okay. What you're saying about that. Now, when they had this connection, this was not during the moments of the murder, correct? Because he had his phone off then. Is this when he was surveilling the house over the course of several weeks? Correct. Because he turned his phone off at the time that he committed the crime, but he was reported to have been driving around there that night where they got him driving up and down the road making his U-turn, suspicious parking. Um, You know, he did a three-point turn somewhere, I think, what, within 20 minutes, 25 minutes of committing this uh, disgusting crime. Um, And so that would have been the footprint he was leaving around that time. Then he turned his phone off, so therefore he would technically leave no trace, but he left plenty of Sure. Plenty of evidence along the way at that point. So essentially what they're saying is if you go into the the inner workings of the Bluetooth device and on the log of what's been accessed, if you look at like a probably a text file or something, it's going to show you timestamps and the name of the device that saw it, basically. Not necessarily connected to it, but it saw it and it, it gave a message onto his phone uh, as this is within range to connect to, should you want to. So we're probably all doing this everywhere we go all the time. Pretty much. And and this is a great question for some sort of cybersecurity expert that yeah. can really get into the the, the details and, reg- and how that how they're able to capture that information. Now, I don't know if they've captured this information from the devices within uh, or around the residence where the crimes happened, or did they get this from his own phone and technology that they're able to go back on and figure out, did he leave a footprint from his phone that actually links it to, mm. like, let's just say, that residence or to a neighboring residence? So I don't know which way it was. Yeah, I would believe it would be something in and around the house itself, not so much on his phone, but, but he left some sort of digital footprint that cybersecurity and some sort of uh, – you know, FBI analysts were able to to dig into and extrapolate, which is great because yeah. uh, it just goes to show there's no such thing as a perfect crime. And in this case, we already know that anyway. Yeah, I mean, it makes you wonder. It probably almost would, I would guess, at least be on your own phone as the log, possibly on those devices if they keep a log of some sort. But even more interesting is if both the logs match up and it shows right. this time to that time. There's no questioning, you know, that digital footprint that's been made. Speaking of of digital footprints, I mean, everything that is out there that we do for the most part, it's tracked, it's traced. There's a digital footprint of some shape or form. 
how difficult is this or are these things to to bring up in court, uh, whether you're a defense attorney or a prosecutor, uh, and, and have, you number one, your jury understand what you're talking about? I know, obviously, you got to do some sort of education here, mm-hmm. but, you know, sometimes you can sit there. I, I know I, I sit sometimes with my parents and hours trying to explain things, and it's still, well, I, I'm just going to go back to the eight tracks, I feel the same way with right. my daughter sometimes because she'll try and explain the same thing to me. And I feel like, oh, my God, I get what my parents are going through. Um, but right. how easy is this to communicate the importance and the weight of it to a jury with technology that, you know, didn't exist or really wasn't discussed, you know, <laughs> anywhere in the past? Right. Well, this is that. And that's a good uh, it's a great question. And that is something where the skill set of the prosecutor really needs how needs to ask the questions correctly in order to get the jury to understand. So the expert witness that he's going to have up there on the stand can go ahead and start explaining what is the distance away from the residence that it needs to be in order to pick up so that we can put him within a certain range, right? And start systematically asking the questions to paint the perfect picture for the jury. And so that's really when that skill set and those years of experience really come into play because you've got to be able to set that stage, but you also need to have the right expert witness Mm -hmm. that knows how to explain it down to the lowest level, you know, because you want it to be able to be transparent all across the board. So everybody's like, ah, I see how that worked now. Yeah. Now defense attorney, it doesn't matter what you say. They're going to throw that. They're going to throw everything they can at the wall to see what sticks. Um, They're going to poke hole, try to poke holes. And even if they knew this is great evidence, I don't know how to get around this. They're going to, they're going to throw things at it anyway. So they're going to, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a proven method or it could be, could be, you know, whatever reasons they want to come up with. But I just think it's very important for the prosecutor because it is great evidence, right? You're mm-hmm. literally putting your suspect in and around that area at that exact time. You can probably track the movements if you picked up on multiple Bluetooth, uh, you know, capabilities on that journey. Mm-hmm. And now you're able to paint that clear picture. So no matter what, the jury doesn't get it wrong. I mean, it's perfect for the prosecutor. It's a nightmare for defense. It's it's almost where the the prosecutor really needs to make this super clear so they fully understand it because the the defense is going to come in and almost purposefully try and discredit and almost confuse the jury as to what all this technology stuff is about. We don't that that's not reliable, even though it's more reliable than most things. It's a digital footprint, or it, it's it's it, you know it's almost like DNA in some ways. Um, right, there, there's of course uh, been talk and and there's been comments about uh, Koberger applying for an internship at the Pullman Police Department. Public records requests conducted uh, by the Independent uh, received the official response of the Pullman Police Department does not have the documentation regarding whether or not Mr. Koberger was chosen for the internship position. Uh, that's how they responded in an email. Is this intentionally vague? Are they looking to answer yeah. with no actual answer? It, it's not like they knew this was an alleged murderer at the time who was wanting the internship at the police department. They don't want to take any claim whatsoever to this guy applying even for the position, let alone if he got it. So, yeah, this was purposefully, in my opinion, I could be wrong, but purposefully, uh, yeah, we didn't, we, we don't know anything about this or if he got the position. And, uh, yeah, we're just going to hands off of it because the background checks wouldn't have gone so well with that either. I wouldn't want him, I wouldn't want him associated with my department either. So, um, yeah, I, I don't see them taking claim to it. That's for sure. But I don't blame them either. If if he did get the position, because we don't know either way, really, right now, if mm-hmm. he did or did not, is that information that would eventually come out in in discovery or something? Would they not have to at some point? I would imagine some uh, the, the prosecutor or defense somebody is is looking at this for some sort of advantage uh, in this case. Well, there's always going to be a paper trail. I mean, he would have had to have applied for it online. So there would be email exchanges, applications submitted. So I would imagine when they did the search warrant on his place, plus what they did at the parents' house, if he brought the computer with him at that time, they've meticulously gone through every single file on there. So I do think it'll come out at some point or another of exactly what files were on that computer. They'll know who he's applied to, what the correspondence was. So I'm sure that link will come out at some point or another. But I don't. I can't blame the department for wanting to be as hands off as humanly possible with whatever application he's submitted for any position with them. I wouldn't want him cleaning the floors, let alone 
uh, being a part of any investigative or having any intel to any type of investigative um, cases coming up. That's a scary thing because that's something that they've uh, talked about a little bit of, well, if he did have the position, what sort of information would have he had access to? Did that play a part in any of this? I imagine we'll just have to wait to see if, if anything comes out. Typically, typically when you have an intern, uh-huh. they're just that they're an intern. So they're, they're sure. running different paperwork, making copies, putting together, you know, like, uh, for instance, if there's shift changes, mm-hmm. let's say they have an A shift and a B shift. So when you come on, a lot of times we'll have a hot sheet for stolen vehicles. They might have B, uh, a, refer to as bolos, be on the lookout, mm-hmm. um, for whatever might be vehicle, missing person, um, you know, suspect for a particular case. So they're kind of putting that stuff together. Um, they might get to go out and do some field rides periodically where they get with a field training officer and they're allowed to go to, to little things, but they're not going to be in the interrogation rooms. They're not going to be able to stand there and listen to uh, a detective talking to somebody about, you know, a homicide or a robbery. They're not going to be on any of the crime scenes. They're not going to let them within that tape to do so as an intern. So usually the background check is relatively soft. It's mm-hmm. just going to be, is there, have you had any prior arrest? Um, you know, maybe a psychological exam, which would have been interesting if he had done that um, and just kind of see what comes of it. But for the most part, it would have been relatively soft, not as in, in depth if he was an actual officer or detective or anything like that. Jim Rathman, always a pleasure to have you on, former Secret Service investigative consultant. Be sure to press subscribe wherever you download podcasts. You don't miss any of our breaking updates and discussions on the cases that we're following for you right here. You can follow me on Twitter at Tony B Pod. Until next time, for all of us, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening. Mm